Let's see, we have a first time speaker, uh, Joe Leon. Uh, Joe is an offensive security engineer with 40 North Security, where he works on red team assessments, pen testing, and web app assessments. He's also a master's student at NYU and previously taught at Black Hat USA 2019 and the Way West Wild West Hackenfest. Uh, and today he is talking about living off the land with a side of bubble tea. Just about every month, there's a bunch of new posts about ways to repurpose legitimate Microsoft signed binaries to achieve some malicious goal, such as executing arbitrary code. In this talk, we'll venture beyond the basics of Cert Util and run DLL32 and look at how attackers use MS Build and WMIC to execute arbitrary C sharp code. This is a fundamental concept in red teaming and internal pen testing and important for all junior analysts to understand. And during the second half of this talk, we'll learn about his passion, bubble tea. Prior to visiting any new city, I always Google for bubble tea shops. I've been drinking bubble tea since 2005, but many people have never tasted this delicious, milky tapioca drink. I'll share the origins of bubble tea, explain how to order, as well as how to make your own version at home. So, Joe, you ready to present now? Yes, sir. Getting the uh, webcam up, too, in case people want to want to see. I don't know if anybody can see, but is the audio coming in clear? Audio is clear, so without any further ado, I give you Joseph Leon with Living Off the Land with a side of bubble tea. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited. This is my first talk. Uh, so without much ado, let's jump in. I uh, already had a bit of background on me. In addition to what you just heard, um, I just wanted to mention also that a couple of my interests in information uh, security Social engineering, I actually started my career in sales, learned a lot of the basic foundations of social engineering. So that's a big passion of mine as well. Also built a small SaaS company. So web app testing is another passion. And then I would say number three on that list is what we're gonna talk about today, living off the land. I'm really excited to share that with you guys. And then later on, we'll, we'll get into uh, my non-work passion of bubble tea. Okay, so living off the land. Before we jump in anymore, I just wanna share a little bit about the goals of what I thought would be, that, that I want you guys to gain from this talk. So first and foremost, what is living off the land? Just being able to describe and understand it. Also, why is it important? Why is this a concept that a lot of folks talk about that there's a lot of research on? Why should you care about it? And then this is the most important part. Let's see some concrete examples. I want to show you Cert Util, which is a super basic example, um, but I also want to go beyond that. I want to show you MS Build as well as Wimic um, and how those two binaries can be used to execute arbitrary code on a target machine. And last but not least, for those of you that are a bit more experienced with living off the land and Lobos stuff, um, conducted a bit of original research in the last few months, published a post uh, last month on a new way to use MS Build and wanted to make sure that those of you that are more experienced have something to take home as well. So we'll go over the basics and then I'll share a little bit about that research just briefly uh, as well so that might be something new for the more experienced folks. So with that, let us jump in. The core of what we're talking about today is repurposing Microsoft signed binaries to do something that we want. That's it, that's the main idea of what we're talking about. But I wanna get really tangible. So let's jump into an example. Uh, let's say I asked you or you had a requirement of downloading a web page from a web server via the command line. And let's just say that's Google's homepage in this case. Uh, if you're on a Linux machine, it's pretty easy. We have curl, wget. It's not that tough to get a, uh, a web page down. So there's a, just a, a quick example. But if I ask you to do that on Windows, on the command line, you're going to pause because there's not a good tool default installed everywhere to do that. Uh, there is no curl and wget arts installed by default everywhere. So what would you do? That's where cert util comes in. Uh, so this will be your first low boss, if this is new to you, or low bass, depending on how you pronounce it. And don't worry what that means. I'll explain that in a second. I'll think you might be able to guess. Uh, but let's first look at cert util. Like what is this, what's this about? What's this used for? You probably haven't even heard of it before unless you know about this uh, repurposing of the binary. So this is a screenshot right from Microsoft's doc 
documentation. So basically, as, as you can read, it's a command line program dealing with certificate services. So downloading certificates, uh, decoding them, backing up and restoring components, like that's what this binary does. And like, so what? Like who, who cares? Like why is this relevant? Well, this is why. If you run this command, so cert util dash or tack, depending on how you want to say it, tack URL cache, tack split, tack F, and then the domain or the like the web page, the path to the web page, you can actually download uh, an HTML file from a web server or any file from a web server for that matter. Um, and that's pretty cool, right? So we went from not having wget or curl on a Windows machine to now being able to use this built-in binary cert util to download a web page. And that's the core of what we're gonna be talking about for the next like say 15 minutes before bubble tea. Uh, is how can we use some of these Microsoft signed binaries, these applications that are already on Windows and repurpose them to do something that we want. So there's the command in case you're interested in, in trying this out on a Windows machine. But let's take a step back before any more examples uh, and just make sure we're all very crystal clear on what the basic general definition is of living off the land. The idea is that, excuse me, the idea is we're not dropping our own custom written malware, we're not bringing some random tools and dropping them on our target host. Instead, we're using what's already there, these existing Microsoft applications, binaries, and we're repurposing them to conduct whatever we need to do. Download a file like you just saw, execute code. Um, it really just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. To live off the land, a, uh, a binary, an application or file needs to be signed by Microsoft, so it's a Microsoft application. Uh, typically, these need to be installed, already installed, but there are some, um, there are some Microsoft applications that theoretically you could download to the machine that are Microsoft products that we could repurpose. Microsoft Teams is a great example that's not installed globally. A lot of enterprise environments use it, but if it's not on a host that you are targeting, uh, once you're on the machine, it'd be possible to potentially download it and then repurpose that. So again, Microsoft signed binaries, we're typically looking for those already installed, but theoretically, if you could download it and it's a Microsoft product, that would suit the same purpose. And most importantly, we're looking for functionality that can be misused or repurposed, as I like to say, for whatever we're trying to do. On the right, you'll see there's this logo, Lobos, Lobas, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, this is an awesome project. So that stands for living off the land of binaries and scripts. If you just Google Lobos, you'll find this page. This is awesome. When you are looking for a resource to learn more about this, this is where you should start. There's an awesome little search bar there that you could search by the binary name and application, or you could search by the functionality. So let's say you don't want to use cert util to download a file. Well, maybe you could search for download and find out Bits admin could do it too. Um, really just depends on what you're trying to accomplish, but this is a great place and good resource to start and it's constantly being updated too. So when are we gonna use this concept of living off the land? Um, first and foremost, initial access is a great place to start when we're gaining entry. Um, I've put an MS build bypass, which I'll explain in the next section in macros before, which has been very useful. It's great for persistence um, and lateral movement. That might be even the most used uh, example, honestly, when we're trying, and by lateral movement, I mean moving from one host to another within a network. Um, so really at any stage throughout the attack lifecycle, we could use uh, this concept of living off the land. But why does it matter? Like, so we've gotten through the fundamentals, we know what it is, like, but why, like, why do you care? Like, why would you do it? Um, and I boiled it down to four points. I'm sure there's more, but number one, if our traffic looks very similar to a normal user's traffic, so for example, if a machine commonly uses MS Build, for example, and now we're using MS Build in an illegitimate way or just repurposing it, that traffic kind of blends in together. So defenders have a bit more difficult of a time to identify what's malicious versus not malicious. Uh, second, going off of that, is attribution. Um, if an attacker drops custom malware, it's kind of like there's like a fingerprint associated with that malware often. And not saying that it's easy to attribute anything, because it's not, but 
that's a lot different than if an attacker is repurposing existing tools that all of us are using to conduct their malicious activities. It's a lot harder to attribute you know, those actions to one group because all of us could use it. Um, third, and I love this, just taught a course on this recently, it's called application whitelisting. So for those of you that don't know, like we could talk about this for hours, um, but super brief, application whitelisting is where you basically, a uh, network or sysadmin lists out the binaries, say like there's 100 binaries, let's say that they want to allow um, to run on a host, and if a binary is not on that list, it won't run, it just won't at all, it won't execute. And so if we're in an application whitelisting environment, we could repurpose a tool like MS Build or Wimic or uh, Microsoft Workflow Compiler to execute some arbitrary code. Basically, the same result as a custom executable that we would have dropped, but instead we can actually repurpose a Microsoft sign binary to accomplish that in that environment. And last, like just out of laziness, like your tool set's already there. You don't have to bring anything with you, so you might as well learn to use the tools that are already at your disposal. And before the last slide, before we get into some more examples, the tangible examples, just want to share why I chose this talk. Um, first, this is a critical skill for anyone looking to get into offensive security, um, especially for internal penetration tests and red team assessments. It's absolutely critical to know. Uh, second, I started out um, pen testing just on Linux machines, right? And the OSCP was a good intro to some Windows machines, but um, I didn't have that much experience with Windows, and I started hearing people talk about living off the land. And conceptually, I understood. I don't think it's that hard to conceptually understand what living off the land is. It's just the tangible examples. I didn't have that many. Uh, and that's what I wanted to share with you all, so that whenever you hear this term, there's no doubt in your mind what it means, how it can be used, what are a few examples? So I think that's really important. And last, and I bolded this for a reason because I'm gonna share a little bit of research that I've done. It really doesn't matter how much experience you have in this field. You could actually do original research tomorrow on this. There are so many Microsoft binaries out there that have unexplored functionality that as long as you have enough time and patience to dig into the documentation on Microsoft's website, you can probably find something, some feature, some like, flag in the, you know, the command line that you could repurpose to achieve something. Uh, and so I bring that up because it's a good way, especially for more junior folks, to publish some original research, things that, you know, haven't really been seen, at least publicly before, um, and perhaps even give a talk. Like, it's a great way to, to get started um, getting your name out there. So with that, let me share some examples. So we're going to talk about MS Build first. So I love this one. MS Build stands for Microsoft build engine. Um, it's included with .NET version 2 and newer. It's in that general path, the C Windows Microsoft .NET framework path. Um, and the general idea is it's building projects. You can pass in a .proj P -R -O -J, or .cs P -R -O -J project file, uh, and it will build that. In fact, if you load up a project in Visual Studio and you hit build, um, it's invoking MS build in the back. That's what's happening. So that's what MS Build does, is it builds projects. In addition to passing in a .C Sharp project file name, you could also pass in an XML file. And what that XML file would be is schema to define how the build process should go. And as you can imagine, when you're building, there might be a task that you want to, to conduct. So like maybe it's setting up like, I don't know, some data structure or something, something that you need set up during the build process. Well, what we're going to do is create an XML schema project file for MS Build, and in the tasks section, in a task section, uh, we're going to insert some arbitrary code. In this case, it would just be to open up the calculator app, and in fact, all of the examples will, but it could be any malicious C sharp code that you. So, in case that wasn't very clear, I want to show an example because I think that's the best way to learn. So, I'm going to get super concrete here. First thing we're going to do is create an XML file. This, you could find this general template online very easily. Um, basically, don't, I mean, there's a lot of like at the beginning and the bottom, like don't worry about all this stuff. I'll show you exactly what they're focusing on. It's this in the box, this execute function. That's going to be the key. Now, this is written in C Sharp. For those of you that aren't familiar with C Sharp or the .NET framework, don't worry. Uh, if you have any programming background, it really shouldn't be difficult to follow along, at least 
definitely in this presentation, but also just kind of generally online looking at kind of templates to get started, shouldn't be that difficult. Um, but in this case, what we're doing is we're creating this public function or method called execute. And all we're doing is calling process.start, and that's just starting the calculator application. So this is the XML file. The beginning part looks very standard for an MS Build XML file. And then we're creating this task. And in this task, we happen to be including some code that we want executed. To actually execute that code, we're going to call the MS Build binary. We're going to pass in the XML file path. And that's it. pretty simple, two steps. One, let's define this XML file, include our code, and two, we'll call the binary. So I'm gonna show a quick like five second example. In the back, you can see this uh, XML file, the same one you just saw, and then you can see the command line argument that I'm gonna call. So you'll see that the build succeeded. In the back, you can see it's green, and then the calculator app opened up. Okay, so do people actually use this? I feel like I'm always asking that when I see a presentation like this, like, yeah, like that was so easy. Like, are people using this? Yes, like we use it a lot. Obviously we use it in a much more complex way, um, but that general principle is used all the time. Um, like I mentioned, you can even embed it in a macro. Like it's, there's a lot of different ways you could, you could use this. Okay, next example, Wimic. Okay, so Wimic pronounced Winic, like I'm saying, uh, it's located, there's two versions. There's a System32 directory version and a Syswell64 directory version. It stands for the Windows Management Instrumentation Command Line Utility. It's a lot to unpack, uh, but the basic general idea is it allows network administrators to query a local or remote machine for some type of information. Uh, for example, process listing, uh, total physical memory, what's the OS version, things like that. It just lets them query information. And so we're gonna misuse Wimic as well. Here's an example of Wimic using, uh, being used in a legitimate fashion. So this is just a process listing, pretty standard. Okay, so the first variation. Uh, this is not my favorite, but I just wanted to call it out there because it's an easy way to get started. Um, Wimic basically built in will let you spin up a new application pretty quickly, or create a new process rather. So Wimic process call create and then the name of the application, that gets you started pretty quickly. Uh, and maybe that's a good place to start. Uh, but to me, that's not super exciting. I'd rather talk about this. So this was in the previous slide about the process listing. There was this format flag and it says list. And what that says is we're going to style the output as a list. So that's why it's nice and orderly. If I didn't have that, it'd be all jumbled up, it'd be hard to read. But I said, make the output format in list format. And so that's very helpful for reading legitimate Wimic commands uh, output. However, we can misuse that. So in addition to the slash format list, you can also pass in an XSL file. Um, so I had no idea what an XSL file was before this. Just think of as CSS is to HTML, right? It's cas cascading style sheets, cascade style sh styling sheets is to HTML, XSL is to XML. So XML is the output from Wimic. And so XSL is styling the XML output from Wimic. So what we can do is create a malicious XSL file and it can execute the code embedded in there, very similar to the XML file we just created. So let me show you a concrete example. Don't worry about the, the top or the bottom part of, of this. It's just like the XSL preamble, and like the end and the closing text. The key is in the center. So in this situation or this uh, in this example, we are using JScript. Now, JScript and JavaScript have similar origins, but they're not the same language. I'm not an expert in it, so I will leave it there, but it's not the same thing. Uh, so just wanted to call that out there, but I'm not an expert, so I, <laughs> I won't explain it anymore, but JScript is used quite a bit uh, in our work. Um, and in this case, we're calling out um, the same thing. We're just creating a calculator application process to, we're just creating a process and running calculator application in it uh, via an ActiveX object and the WScript shell. So we're using JScript to do that. So again, if you're not familiar with JScript, don't worry. 
but this is doing the same thing as process dash uh, dot start as before. And here, all we need to do to execute it is call a legitimate Wimic command. I showed you a different command this time instead of process get just to show you something different. So this is computer system get total physical memory. So it's a legitimate command to get the, as you can imagine, the total physical memory on the host. Um, and the format is for passing in our malicious XSL file. That's the key. Um, and let me show you a quick example. So again, this is the same exact, from the screenshots, it's the same XSL file in the background. And then you can see the command is the same in, in the command prompt. And then let's see, uh, let's see it happen. So importantly, in the background, you can see the command actually ran successfully. You can't actually see the total physical memory because the calculator is blocking it, but it, it conducted that query and then it formatted it, meaning it executed our J script, which created our calculator function. So once again, are people actually using this? Yes. Uh, and I'll tell you why. If you look down here in JScript, that section, uh, there's a lot of ways to take C sharp code and turn that into JScript, right? So we could start with C sharp source code, like whatever we want, and we could run it through dot with the JScript, gadget the JScript, I think shell, shell code the JScript. There's a few different tools out there which will take our C sharp code and convert it into JScript. And so that enables us to use Wimic to uh, execute arbitrary C sharp code. Okay, so I promise those of you that are a bit more advanced, I would share quickly uh, some original research. So this is another MS build uh, code execution technique. Um, this is published on the 40 North Security blog just about a month ago. Um, and let me quickly show you. So we had this XML file before, if you remember, and I highlighted this execute function where we're calling the calculators. Uh, application to start. Well, also in this file, there was this thing called using task. There's this tag, right? Using task, defining a task to run that happens to be executing our code and starting the calculator app. Um, and we were on assessment in December and they caught us um, when we were trying to run this, this, this uh, bypass. And my guess is something was signature based on this using task bit or task being in the XML file. Could be wrong, but I was like, you know what, I wanna find a way that I can do the same thing but not have to define an inline task, which is what we're doing here. So I did a bit of research on MS Build on Microsoft site, and I came across this other task called unregister assembly. And as you can read, it says it unregisters the specified assemblies for COM interop purposes. Too much to unpack in like a couple minutes, but suffice to say, if we define a function that is com visible and it unregisters this com object, then it maybe it does. It <laughs> will execute the code inside that unregister function. That was my hypothesis. It turned out to be true. Um, and so that's that's kind of the research that we were doing. So also on that same web page about um, unregister assembly, it gave us some sample XML. So this is just like the XML file I showed you before, and this is straight from Microsoft site and there's no task anywhere. Technically, unregistered assembly is still a task, but we're not defining an inline task. This looks totally different than the previous method. Um, and so let me walk you through how this actually work, would work. So first, we wanna create some C-sharp code. Again, we're not doing anything that fun, we're just opening the calculator application. But the key here is we're defining, um, unlike before when it's in this execute function, we're defining our malicious code in this com unregister function uh, in this public unregister yeah, function. So after we define that um, or save that source code, we're going to compile it into a .NET assembly, in this case, a library to a .dll file. That would be the command to do it. Then we're going to adjust our XML file. I literally uh, copied that from Microsoft's website. All we're gonna do is change the output path and file name to go right to our DLL file. Nothing else has to change. And then just like before, we invoke the MS Build binary and provide it the XML file path. And here is a quick example just to orient you on what's going on in the screen. Middle left is the C sharp source code. Same thing as before. We're going to first compile that using CSC 
And in the background is the XML file that already references a, the DLL that we are going to compile. So I will run that real quick. So that file has been compiled. We directory list, we can see that DLL is there now. And since that DLL is already referenced in the XML file and we call MS build against it, the build succeeds and the calculator application opens. So that's a new research, new in that we haven't found any public um, blogs or anything about it. I imagine some advanced threat actor has used it before, but it's not something that I've seen. Um, and so that's just an example of, uh, I dug into this MS build binary a little extra, looked through some documentation and found something, something new. Um, and so I encourage all of you to, to do that as well. And there's just so many binaries that you could do this with. In terms of resources, like I mentioned, that Lobos project, I would say is number one. DerbyCon 3 living off the land is kind of like the seminal talk, I guess. I, it's like one of the first talks of the modern era about this. Uh, if you're going to follow two people on Twitter related to stuff, I'd recommend Casey Smith at SubT and Matt Graber at Manifestation. And if you're interested in reading our research on that new MS code bypass, um, it's at a slash blog on our website. Okay, enough tech stuff. Bubble tea. All right, so just like before, a little background on myself related to bubble tea. Um, I've been consuming bubble tea since 2005. I'm approaching 1,000 lifetime bubble teas consumed, which is quite a milestone. Uh, and there's a map that I put together of all the different cities where I have consumed uh, bubble tea. So obviously heavy in the U.S. where I'm from, but also in Europe, uh, throughout Asia. Um, haven't traveled uh, very much to other parts of the world. Otherwise, you would you would see uh, dots there as well. Okay, so bubble tea. If you don't know what bubble tea is, let me explain it. Because I feel like folks that don't know what it is, they hear it and they just kind of like write it off because it's like, what is that? That's so confusing. Like, what do you mean bubble? What, what bubbles? So first off, bubble tea is literally tea, like iced tea often or hot tea with milk maybe, or some fruit flavor maybe, or just plain. That's the tea. And then you add a topping, which honestly is a misnomer because it's not really a topping if it sinks to the bottom, which always happens. Uh, in fact, these photos are extremely misleading because like, I don't know, whenever they put bubbles in my drinks, they always fall to the bottom. But anyway, so a topping could be bubbles, uh, could be jelly, red beans, basil seeds, like there's a lot of different things that it could be. So what are the bubbles? So traditional, the traditional topping is boba or bubbles or tapioca pearls. Uh, so what these are, are small black spheres made of tapioca starch. Now what is tapioca starch? That comes from the cassava root. What is cassava? Cassava is a shrub from South America, but it's also known as yuca. You might have had it before. Um, yuca fries or boiled yuca is a common side dish. Um, highly recommend trying that. Also, as another side note, highly recommend trying tapioca pudding if your grandma never made it for you because it's incredible. Cozy Shack does no justice to my grandma's tapioca pudding, but feel free to start there. Uh, and what we're doing is we're taking this tapioca starch from the cassava shrub and we're combining it with water and food coloring and sugar. And then we're rolling it and molding it into these like little spheres. And those are called tapioca pearls or boba. And then they're hard, like they're, um, like they're raw. And then what we'll do to cook them is we'll cook kind of like rice. Like we'll boil some water, throw them in there, let it boil a little bit, let it simmer for maybe 15 minutes, and then let it sit in some sugar for another 15 minutes. And then, then you're good to go. Um, a quick side note here. So boba is a term that I mentioned. So bo boba could refer to both uh, the tapioca pearls, like the bubbles, or it could refer to the entire drink. So like the cup, the tea, the ice, the toppings, the straw, like that whole thing could, could be called boba too. It really depends, I think, on where you're from. Uh, so just to clarify. In addition to boba or bubbles, there's a lot of other toppings. So like there's aloe vera, there's grass jelly, there's basil seeds, red beans, which I think are really weird, but apparently they're good. There's pudding. You could put flan in there, yogurt, like it's all types of crazy. You can do anything that you want in there. And it might sound really random, all these topics, but they're not. QQ. You're like, what? QQ, like the letter Q, the letter Q. It's a Taiwanese word that stands for chewy or bouncy. 
springy, basically anything that like it's soft but gives some resistance as you're biting into it. That texture is called QQ. And so that term originated in Taiwan. Uh, it's that chewy texture. Um, and I found two quotes in a New York Times article that I thought were helpful in explaining what this is. So Q texture is to Taiwanese what umami is to Japanese and al dente is to Italians. Like it's just critical to the culinary uh, arts in Taiwan. And also uh, a Mr. Liu, I'm honestly not sure who Mr. Liu is to be fair, but it's in the article. But he says, you can tell if bubble milk tea is good based on how cute the tapioca pearls are. Like that's critical, right? That's how they describe the texture. And it's very, very apt. Like you, it's soft to bite into, but there's resistance. That's QQ. A little more history. Um, the exact origin of bubble tea is a little disputed, primarily probably because folks want to take credit for it and there's conflicting stories. But generally, folks will agree that it came from a Taiwanese tea house in the mid 1980s. Tea houses have been in Taiwan for a long time. Milk tea had been consumed in Taiwan as well. And the basic story goes that one day somebody had this tapioca dessert and they poured it into their tea and they're like, wow, this is incredible. Like obviously. Uh, and that's where we have bubble tea today. It's spread throughout Asia, Europe, globally. Um, I would say in the US, California, I would say it's probably the capital. Um, had some really good bubble tea in, in California, but they are, they are everywhere. Bubble tea shops are everywhere. Here are a few logos of various bubble tea uh, tea shops. So like I've been to all of these except Fat Straws. Fat Straws had a cool logo and a cool concept when I was doing this research. They're based out of Portland, I believe. Um, but all these other brands are solid places to go. And I would bet most of you have, at least in the United States, yeah, at least in the US, most of you probably have one of these within an hour drive or less. So deciphering the menu is a little difficult. So I wanted to share a little bit about how I approach it. First, uh, and this is from a, a shop called, called Served, which I believe is in Texas. Um, the key first is you want to figure out what type of drink are you interested in? Just regular tea? Is it milk tea? Maybe you want coffee uh, or a smoothie. Like all of these are on the table. So you choose your base and then you choose your flavor. So if you're just having plain tea, typically you could add in a fruity flavor like lychee or pineapple. If you're having milk tea, it's more common to do like chai milk tea or matcha milk tea or coconut milk tea or taro milk tea. If you're doing coffee, like typical coffee flavors, hazelnut, caramel, et cetera. Once you decide your base and your flavor, you go to the toppings. So this store happens to have a lot of extra toppings. They have protein, they have chia seeds, wheatgrass, uh, flan they're putting in here for some reason. Like there's a lot of different options uh, there. Another example, Kung Fu tea. So similar menu style, a little less clear, but it's the basic same principle. If you look to the bottom half on the white background area, classics on the left side, that's basically your plain tea or maybe tea with honey. Below it's your milk tea. On the right, you've got your plain tea plus some fruit flavor. That's the punch section. And then below are slushies. So that's kind of more like a smoothie, I guess. And then up top, you can choose your toppings, similar toppings like we talked about before. And then last, the boba guys. Um, this is only a small portion of their menu, but um, basically you would, at, up to this point, you would have chosen your base and your flavor. And now you choose your topping. I brought this one in here because milk, um, that's important to some people. Um, people have different tolerances to dairy milk. So just a few different places have different options. Like the boba guys will do oat milk or almond milk or just cow's milk. And then you can specify the sweetness level. So what are you going to order? This is the top 10 from Kung Fu, which is one of my favorites. Um, all of these look good to me except the um, winter melon one. I don't think that one's for me, but all the rest look pretty good. Uh, but my two favorites are the bottom right two, honey green tea and taro milk tea, or taro slush. So if I had to give you guys two recommendations to start, I would say give taro milk tea a try. If you don't know what taro is, it's a root vegetable that forms, um, it's like it's, a, it ends up being purple. It's like slightly sweet, a little bit of a nutty flavor, kind of like kind of vanilla-ish. Uh, and it forms the base of a lot of Asian desserts. And in the taro milk tea, you would typically find some type of milk ice, tea, um, taro flavoring, it could be powder, it could be a syrup maybe, it could be actual taro, depends on, realistically depends on how expensive the drink is. If it's like $3, it's probably just powdered flavoring. 
And if it's like seven dollars, and it's probably like the actual taro root potentially, and then you put bubbles in that. Um, my second recommendation, and this is my go-to, my favorite, and I have to say this is probably a place to start if you like ice study, is get green tea, honey black tea. Uh, so that's just plain green or plain black tea with honey added to it, some ice, and then you can add a topping to it. So the bubbles, the tapioca is great. I like aloe vera, lychee jelly is good. You could really experiment with that one, but it's a pretty like neutral flavor to then add toppings to it. Um, in terms of tips for ordering, first and foremost, I would say be mindful of the sugar level. When I introduce folks to bubble tea for the first time, I always forget to tell them about the sugar level. If a store allows you to tell, you, tell them how much sugar to put in, I usually opt for like zero to 10 or 20%. Um, if you go with the regular amount of sugar, sometimes they dump in like a quarter, half cup of sugar. It's like insane. It's like really sweet. If you like that, by all means, go for it. Just fair warning. Uh, you can also choose between hot and cold. I think cold's better generally, but you could do either. There's a whole bunch of different toppings. Start with the bubbles, but try something else too. And like I mentioned before, like if, if dairy is a concern, just check what milk they use. A lot of places will use powdered non-dairy creamer, which might be fine. Um, and some of the higher end tea shops will use like milk in like cow's milk or soy milk or whatever milk. Um, just you can just ask, I would recommend. Um, and then the straws, don't forget the straws. So these straws are a lot, it's kind of hard to tell. This is a zoomed in picture, but like they're pretty thick. And obviously it's to soak up the, or to scoop up the toppings. Um, so make sure you grab a straw because you can't use like any normal straw with this experience. Um, and then, my main tip for drinking, once you get the bubble tea, and I wish I had one here, it's hard to get one right now, but um, the way they do it is they, like, they'll take a plastic cup that pour your drink in, then they put it in a machine that um, kind of like taps over a lid, and the lid could be plastic or thick paper. And you gotta pierce the lid with your straw, and the straw is like a pointy end. And so you wanna be very quick and decisive with piercing that lid with your straw, otherwise, it can like really make a mess. Like if you pierce it just a little bit, it spills everywhere and it's a disaster. And it shows that you are a, uh, a novice at the bubble tea uh, experience. So like definitely like quick, decisive piercing of the lid. Uh, and then last year, um, when I, when people are like, what is bubble tea like? For those of you that haven't had it, I like created this flow chart to think about whether someone that I know would like bubble tea. So the first thing I would ask, and you can self-reflect, do you like, gummy candy. And I think gummy bears are the right texture. Like, do you like that texture? If you like that texture and you like tea, you are going to love bubble tea. If you like that texture and you don't like tea, you probably will still like it, but try like coffee or try like, if you like coffee or like uh, a slush, like, or a milk tea, something that like might be more milkshakey, um, give that a shot. If you don't like gummies, gummy candy, um, and you like tea, Maybe, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you would want a different topping and not tapioca. Um, if you don't like gummy candy and you don't like tea, like that's a weird choice, but I respect it. You're not gonna like it. This is not for you, I'm sorry. I wasted uh, 20 minutes of your time, but at least you know. Uh, but still, you might wanna try it. And just to recap everything, so we're taking tea, maybe we're adding milk, maybe we're adding fruit flavor, we're adding some topping like cooked tapioca, taking a thick straw, and that's bubble tea. Like plain and simple, that is bubble tea. Um, just want to mention all the images that I got, unless I took it from Microsoft or from PNG Guru. And with that, thank you all very much for your time. I'm at Joe Leon Jr. on Twitter and GitHub. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we do have one question from the audience. Uh, are the juice flavors a mixture or just plain juice and toppings? So typically what happens is you will choose green tea or black tea or oolong tea or some type of base tea. And then they will have a, typically what I've seen is like, um, you know, like at, at Starbucks or a coffee shop where they like squirt in the, like the syrup, it's kind of like that where they have a flavored syrup for whatever um, juice, like whatever fruit you want and they'll pour some in there. Some places will actually use fresh fruit, which is great. Um, and I don't get it too often, to, to be honest, the, the fruit flavors, um, but I imagine you could ask them to combine them. Like, there's no reason why you couldn't do like lychee and strawberry or something, whatever, whatever you wanted to do.
Fantastic. And uh, other, uh, question question from me. Uh, have you sure. ever tried uh, avocado or durian for this? So durian, uh, not a huge fan of. Uh, that has been tried. But avocado, I have heard, and that's just my personal opinion. Like I've, a lot of people like the taste Balti. Now that's not for a first timer, I would say. Uh, but avocado is interesting. I haven't. I've seen that many times. I just actually haven't ventured to try it because, like, I found a few that I really like, and I just constantly get those. But I do need to venture out more. Uh, but uh, I have not. Have you? Have you tried it before? Oh yeah, I love it. <laughs> I'm kind of a ringer here because uh, we have a lot of this in Southern California. Sorry. Yep. Yep. I know you got. Yeah. So yeah, um, personally, I happen to like uh, almond. Yeah, that's a great a great flavor as well. I mean, there's so many there's so many options. Like literally any any taste that you have for like anything sweet related, they they can probably accommodate there. Fantastic. Well, great to hear from you. And uh, so just. Uh, a quick bit of organizational stuff. We are working on getting the next talk set up. There's been a technical issue, so we may be a minute. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Joe, thanks very much for your talk and uh, very glad to have that information you, from you. Alrighty. Thank you. So uh, while we get set up here, I'll go ahead and bounce the recording and uh, we'll start working on getting the next presenter set up for you. The next scheduled presenter will be scheduled, at least scheduled to start in about four minutes. It may take us a minute or two longer.